our stories are messy. You know, there's this likable kid or likable person. The middle part is the messy middle. We encounter these roadblocks and trials and tests. And then the third act is we're changed by it all. Hi, everybody. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm super, super excited to have my next guest here. We have Nancy Duarte, who is the CEO and uh, serial author of uh, many, many incredible books that we'll talk about, but uh, she is the CEO of Duarte, and she's just this incredible, incredible entrepreneur, leader, um, storyteller, communicator uh, to so many, so many great uh, people who, people and company all over the world. And um, I think that the key thing that I've seen Nancy do is really simplify things for people and really uh, take ideas and create the most powerful tools people have to be able to get their messages out there. So she has an incredible TED talk as well. So in case you're not familiar with Nancy, you should definitely listen to that. And as I said, she's worked with many, many companies and top executives. She's also worked with Al Gore uh, too on, on that incredible talk that he did. And just more than anything, I think she is just a wealth of information on messaging and communication and highly sought after that I feel like so lucky that we're able to have her here today. So welcome, Nancy. It's so good to see you, Kara. Great to see you too. So you have such a natural gift for storytelling. Where did this come from? I mean, what? Let's let's go back to kind of the the beginning of of Nancy and and kind of your life early on. How funny! Yeah, you know the the way you worded the question so interesting because my uh, when I was really little, uh, my mom took a picture. It's the only picture I have of myself alone, and I'm not really in it. What she took was a picture of I had laid out like a little dish towel, a green dish towel. I'd found little objects around the house and put them on this dish towel, and then I would arrange them and rearrange them and arrange them, and I would just tell stories. I would just like that was my play was this little dish towel with these found objects, and my I you know life is cruel sometimes in some ways. So I, I was raised in this kind of economically and emotionally starved environment, you know, which comes with all the neglect and abuse, you know, mom with mental illness, alcoholism, you know, all that, all that show. <laughs> and um, at about at 16, I was 16 years old and she abandoned us. And she's like, go get the car at the airport. I've moved to California and kind of picked up run in the household. And um, the thing about story is they're messy. Our stories are messy. You know, there's this likable kid or likable person. The middle part is the messy middle. We encounter these roadblocks and trials and tests. And then the third act is we're changed by it all. And I, and my childhood shaped me in such a significant way. Um, so when I, by the time I went to college, I, I really wanted to get a degree, but I didn't have the emotional stamina to finish. And my first and only year of college, I got a C minus in speech communication and a, and a D in English. And now I write books in English about speech communication. So I don't recommend every bright young girl do, but it worked for me as I got married at 18. And um, what was interesting is we got married up in a little town in Northern California, Chico, California. And my first job was making $3.15 as a cashier at Long's Drug. And it was in a it was in a time of incredible inflation in early 81 and I, I couldn't get a job I couldn't find a job and finally I went back two weeks later and laid my body across the desk of the hiring manager at Long's Drugs and was like hire me please hire me. like I was just like I need a job so he hired me put you know made me a cashier and like about three months later this guy comes through my line he goes Duarte are you related to Leonard Duarte and I'm like yeah he goes you seem too bright to be a cashier here, will you come and work for me? And he had a, a office supply and typewriter repair store. Who was Leonard, by the way? Leonard's my father-in-law. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's okay. where I get the Duarte yeah. name. And so, thank you. And so, yeah. I this guy named Pete hires me, Pete Reginelli. And I'm 19. He makes me uh, clean. He makes me 
call on customers. Like if I wasn't busy, he put me out in the car. I was like, you go find business. He made me do the sales tax, the income tax. He made me file the, um, he made me do all the purchase. Like he was just like putting me out there, putting it. He demystified entrepreneurism for me, just demystified it for me. Mm. And his business quintupled, like it quintupled within 18 months. And so I was like, wow, like, wow, it was such a delight to, um, to serve him and be so young and thrown into this. It was difficult, but it was really rewarding. And that's kind of, that's kind of where this whole genesis of this, I, you can do anything. Like you just mm-hmm. have, need to have an idea and some business acumen and you can make anything happen and take risks. I think so often, I, I talk about this a lot, that I, I worked for incredible entrepreneurs, including, you know, either directly or indirectly, uh, Ted Turner. I never worked at Apple, uh, but I worked for an idea that was spun out of Apple that was a Steve Jobs idea doing CD-ROM shopping that five guys who worked for Steve uh, I worked for and then uh, ended up, our company got acquired by America Online. And so... Steve Case, right? And so <laughs> Steve Case, I look, amazing entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. And yes. I look back on those experiences. And when I wanted to start my own company, I I realized that they were real people. And it sounds yeah. like the same experience where, you know, you had the you were lucky in many ways to be able to go and work for somebody yeah. who didn't make something so impossible or so hard or put up roadblocks. Instead, they needed help. Right. And they exactly. needed support and you were there to support and thrive. Right. Yeah. And and see their business thrive, which is incredible. So yeah. where so what was the point when you actually started putting presentations together then? That's a great like question. You, you yeah. A so bit of everything there. Yeah, we bounced down to the Silicon Valley about five years into our marriage. Hubby hubby was going to go to school. And what happened was I, I worked at this office supply store. And then I called on the only tech company in Chico and won that as an account. But then I quit my job and went to work for this uh, tech company up there. So it was easy to transition from uh, Chico down here to kind of an electronics distributor. And um, my husband worked his butt off one summer to buy a Mac. And you got to uh, understand this was when it was still, you know, jaggy fonts and they, it wasn't a thing. People thought it was a toy. Nobody really knew what a personal computer could do. And he bought one and we're pitiful poor, care. I mean, it, we're pitiful poor and, you know, hideous shag carpets, itty bitty one room apartment, but we have a Macintosh. <laughs> and he starts to get calls it. like, hey, can you do this resume? Can you do this newsletter? Well, I get very pregnant with my um, second kid, my son. And I'm like, not happy. I'm like, you got to go get yourself a real job. This is a joke. I don't know what you're doing, but you're supposed to be in school, but you're doing new resumes on this. And, um, it, and you know, there's a couple times twice in my life, my husband had to get on his knees to get my attention and beg me to do something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's like full confession. I don't know if you let people confess, do confessions like that I on your it. show, but there That's it is. Great. And he got my attention. He said, will you please read Macworld magazine? Just read it cover to cover and tell me if you don't think this is going to be a big deal. So I read it. I'm like, fine. If I can sell this, you can keep it. If I can't sell it, here's your stack of resumes that you put addresses on, you know. And sure enough, I made calls in one afternoon and we won NASA Tandem, which is now HP Mm -hmm. and Apple big, dubbed a big conference at Apple in one afternoon. And then I was like, we were a business and Apple, people don't realize Apple was the first company to hook up a computer to a projector for a conference. Like before then there were these little 35 millimeter slides. And, and so when Apple had their big layoff in 93, all my Apple clients like scattered all across the Bay area, like little Mm. seeds and, and people didn't know how to design slides. The presentation tools were so ugly, so ugly by default, they were all made by engineers. And that was before you actually, UI had a real magic to it. And so it took like a hammer and an anvil to make a slide look decent. And we were really good at that. And so it just grew from there. I, I, presentations found me. So even though I loved communications and love speech making, if, if we hadn't landed Apple as our first and 
and we still have them as a client. It's 34 years now, 30, yeah, 34 years we've had with them. And um, yeah, if they were not like bleeding edge at presenting, I probably would not be the same company that we are today. That's amazing. Well, yeah. I, I love too that. I, I mean, how old were you at that point? I, right? I was 24 when we moved down here. Right. So 24 yeah. years old. You yeah. hadn't gone to college, you know, you, you just confessed that you, uh, you know, had, <laughs> had, uh, taken a communications class and yet you are starting yeah. a company and you're, yeah. and you're doing something that you and your husband were super passionate about. Yeah. And I think that it starts there, right? That's the seed. You yeah. find the passion, you find something that you really want to be doing and, but, and, and, like, I mean, that's, it's such a great story. It's the entrepreneurial story of really, I think so many entrepreneurs, great entrepreneurs that are out there. And that's what I love about, you know, as I've looked into everything about Nancy, I mean, that's the thing that I think is, is so key. So the yeah. first presentations that we, were you, were you afraid? I mean, you had no idea. Like, where did yeah. you look for guidance to? Yeah, to kind of- you know, it's funny. Um, I had a subscription to Inc. Magazine for the business side, and mm-hmm. I cover to cover read HBR. Got a um, subscription to HBR cover to cover, so I knew what was on the minds of execs, and I read every strategy book that was out then, and and any new and emerging book, like the all the best selling business books. So when I walked in the room, these executives were so busy they weren't as well read as I was, or they were mm-hmm. not on top of it as well. Never once in my entire career did anyone not think I had an MBA. Nobody even asked. So it wasn't until I started to volunteer it that uh, Cisco adopted me into their diverse supplier program as a protege. And they petitioned UCLA to count because at that point, the business was super successful for 25 years. So UCLA accepted me building this really successful business as my undergrad. And then I got an executive MBA at UCLA because Cisco, who's been an amazing partner and client, you know, made that happen for me. So, and they paid for it too, which was really nice. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. It's super, like super nice super when amazing. a company makes a bet on their customer like that. It meant a lot to me. So at what point did presentations really go from, from having too much on the page to yeah. the, to telling the story? Because I think that that is really what you were known for. I mean, it's yeah. really, I think I, I read, Somewhere in in my research that you talk about, you know, most presentations still talk too much about or spend too much time preparing the slides versus actually telling the stories so that you can create this engagement. So how how have presentations really changed over time? That's a good question. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I don't know why, but in each crisis that happens to us, I make really counterintuitive moves. I don't know if that's how you rolled, but um, what happened was in the 2000.com crash, we, we kept trying to not be a presentation company because presentations were reviled. Inconvenient Truth wasn't out. You know, um, TED Talks hadn't won a Peabody Award. And and here we were kind of fighting against fighting upstream for presentations. So we kept saying like, oh, well, we'll do web and print and we'll do all these other things. Dot com bust happens and the phone keeps ringing for presentations and everything else falls away because everyone needs a really great deck in a crisis. Um, And the other thing is Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, came out and it has this um, hedgehog concept that says, if there's one thing you can do, you could be best in the world at, be passionate about and be and be profitable at do just that one thing. So here's the economy's crashing around us. And I decide we're going to shutter the doors on four out of five services and do just presentations. So that was 2000. By 2008, I really did feel like, you know what, we might be best in the world at this. And that was when a friend of mine, like really pressed me to write a book. And that was when my first book came out, which was kind of the defining book, because the default software was still pretty ugly. (laughs) And it was, you know, it was about thinking before you jump into the tools. And it it really was the very first book to put design language into business language um, or design concepts into business language. And so that was um, Slideology in 2008. And thank goodness that book came out when it did, because 2008 was the big bust, right? And the company's uh, revenue 
flattened, but it stayed flat. And flat was the new grow in 2008. And so it just feels like every little arc of innovation. I, I just, I think a lot of entrepreneurs happen to have this sense. It was like a fire burning in my belly. I had to get that done. And I went with whichever publisher would get that out on my son's birthday, which was September 3rd, 2008. And if you look at this, I was just running around for 18 months, like a fire. And just like, and I went with a publisher who got it, who was known for getting books out quickly. And, and it kind of saved the company. And then um, I've written six books since. And yeah, so that's kind of how we focused. And by that focus, which is hard, and you have to be brutal about saying no to other things to maintain this focus. And we were. And my team, I mean, we work with the top execs in the world and the top brands help, you know, help what they say, help with their slides, help coach them on the delivery. And um, and then what happened was 2008, the book came out and the phone starts to ring for training. And we don't have a training. We're a service business at this point. I'm like, well, I'm a capitalist. Building a training company should be easy. <laughs> And so it's had its ups and downs, but it's mostly been up. And so we add, so now you could work with us or learn from us. So we take all this work we do for all these brilliant, brilliant executives on the service side, and then we codify it into training. So everybody, and it's gorgeous training, anybody can learn from how the most powerful people in the world communicate. So it's, it's quite fun. I love what we do. Love what we do. So what do people get wrong when incorporating storytelling into their strategy? Yeah, yeah I think it's lack of empathy. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of times we got to get the strategy done. We're under timeline. We, you know, we, we want to change the world. We want to do these things. And then when it comes time to communicate it, we tend to communicate from our own perspective instead of considering the audience's perspective. And so you'll see in all my books, I try to create a model. Each of them has one or two models for empathy in it um, because of, uh, I didn't really finish the story, but with my mom, uh, when you're a narcissist, you are genetically missing the empathy gene. So here mm -hmm. I'm right. And for girls, it's very important for them to see empathy modeled by their mothers. So here I'm raised by a woman who doesn't notice me, doesn't raise me, doesn't converse with me, never really even learned my kids' names. And um, so clawing at empathy, like I was like, I am not going to be that person. I'm going to be the antithesis of lacking empathy. And to get there, some of the models were from my own mind, my own mindset, mm -hmm. so that I could shift to other centric communication instead of Nancy centric communication. So I think it's like audience first audience obsess over the audience and then create your material. I think that's the biggest thing that, that, that is a void in how, especially execs, you know, everyone serves the execs, everyone tow tows to them. And so of course they think they can just walk on a stage and have it be all about them. And it shouldn't be, it really shouldn't be. So understanding who your audience is, um, mm -hmm. obviously, that is, you know, such a key driver. Uh, but one of the things that I read in, in uh, an HBR article that you had written was just about, uh, you know, female audiences. If you know, for example, that you've got a female audience that is mm -hmm. primarily female, like how does that differ for your storytelling? Yeah. That's a good question because there's broad audiences, which are a mix, right. but then there could be biotech. It could be sales audience. It could be a female right. audience. And and you have to map to what's on their mind. When I'm with a female, well, you and I are in um, the same nomination only like female organization, a uh, female executive organization. And how I show up there is very different than how I would show up at a biotech company. And I think... Um, you have to understand the emotional quotient, um, uh, the old rhetorical, uh, old rhetorical triangle that was first, you know, sketched out by Aristotle. Said there's ethos, pathos, and logos, and that's like emotional appeal, analytical appeal, and your credibility. So if I show up with a biotech audience, which is too much emotional appeal without having massive amounts of analytical appeal, I will my my credibility falls if right. I show up. You know, so I can show up a little bit m m with more emotional appeal to a female audience because our stories align and we're more communal in nature. Just uh, women tend to be more communal. <clears throat> so you have to adapt to who you're talking to. With biotech, I would do, you know, 99% analytics with a small 
small percent of emotional appeal. There's a great story in Resonate, though. There's a Stanford prof, um, professor who wanted to raise money uh, for his lab. And what he did, he was in this big competition that he'd get $2 million if he did a good job. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of came through our course. I even did a whole conversation with him. So when he did this um uh, presented his research to try to get this funding. He was competing with other people and he chose to add just a little bit about how humans would flourish if they funded his research. So everyone else was like, science, 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 science. And he did mm -hmm. the whole science thing with this fine sugar coat of human flourishing. He's like, I don't think my idea was the best, but he, so he's the one who bought it. So it, it's a trick to how thick that, um, how, how much emotion you can put into uh, the audience. And that has to do with knowing who you're talking to and adapting to them. So if you're speaking to your team, as you, you know, touched on, you're, you're an exec and you get up and you're doing a keynote, for example, you know, obviously taking into account the, the industry, but do you talk to them like you're their boss or do you talk to them <laughs> like you're, you're in the same circle? Right. I think it's an important question that I think many executives have. Yeah. You know what? It, I'm so, you, nobody's ever asked me this question. And <laughs> uh, presenting to my own team is the most difficult talk I do ever, ever. And um, it's because when I stand up in front of them, they know I'm going to be asking them to change or asking them to work differently or asking them to you know, reach a goal is so different. Whereas if I travel as a public speaker, they're like, oh my God, you're Nancy, you know, and my team doesn't love when I, you know, have to get, well, they, they do love when I get up, but I changed a lot during COVID and how I communicate too. Um, during COVID, I started to do these really gorgeous video memos where I was, I was, um, uh, appealing to where everyone was at emotionally, but I was there in solidarity. We were all in it together, but we do an annual kickoff. We do our annual kickoff. We, it's called shop week. Um, it's either shop week or shop day. It's usually during MLK week because he, that's our dream. We do our, our vision and dream casting in that week. And it's really funny because, um, uh, you know, there's always uh, questions when you're asking people, hey, here's our vision. Jump in. Jump in with us and, and jump in and help make it happen all in a year. <laughs> and the team, you know, some years it's not been easy and we're still just trying to convince them to jump in. And it's June and we're supposed to be halfway done with these initiatives. Well, we did the January 2020 launch. This is just pre-COVID. Um, it was so good, Kara. We worked so hard on getting people to really see we really did a good job walking in their shoes and, and getting them really excited about this a bit longer goal. I mean, a glee club formed to sing about how excited they were for this. We were going to kind of do a moonshot goal. And even through it all, through COVID, through everything, that vision and that goal kept everyone going. So as a public speaker, as a CEO, people are like, well, you must have it nailed, Nancy, because you're a public speaker and I even need to improve. So one of the things that we did for that particular um, session was I was always bummed because we always do a recap of the previous year and I felt like we'd had a glorious year. And so I was sharing like outcomes in all the previous years, but I thought they were amazing and nobody would clap. Like it was like, and so my coach worked with me. I said, why doesn't anyone clap? And because my coach is in the audience. She's one of my um, brilliant executive coaches. And she's like, well, Nancy, you never take a breath. You don't even stop or pause or do anything. So what we did is I worked with her and she just, all she did is flip certain sentences and had me pause so that it caused this kind of rise of tension and then release of it, which is a great story tactic. And there was so much applause at that vision meeting. It went 10 minutes over the time, which was amazing. Same exact freaking content, but just having the coach massage it and move it and have me pause. It was really amazing. And I work harder on my own internal talks than any talk I do because the stakes are higher. The stakes are really high internally when you can't rally the team to do really brilliant work. Um, so it, it's been a good couple of years um, ever since that kind of visioning exercise went really well. Well, I think also what you're talking about, too, is just being vulnerable as a leader. Yeah. And I think yeah. more people are talking about that, too, that, you know, you showing 
creating that bridge to show how you're like them. You have different stories yeah. than them, but here's your stories. And so that people understand how real you are, you are just an incredible example of that for sure. So let's talk about your TED Talk, which is absolutely <laughs> incredible. How many years ago did you do this? It was 2011. We just had the 10 year anniversary. There's another hidden version of it on Vimeo that has a million views too. So it just hit, it hit 3 million like over Amazing. the last holiday. So there's really 4 million views, but Amazing. I'll take the three. Yeah, it's good. So it was what fun. Are, can you share like the key things that came out of that? I mean, obviously yeah. you talk about the the best pieces of storytelling and, yeah. and uh, but I'd love to hear it from you and yeah. have people share that. Yeah. Delivering a TED talk is hard. Like, And I'm the presentation lady. And literally at the 18 minute mark, they give you a hook or, mm -hmm. or if, if it's three or six or nine or 18, whatever's the length. I mean, they will walk up and pull you off if you don't nail it. And that was hard. I spent 30 five hours just rehearsing. And I had a coach who was like, okay, you know what? That's this part right here isn't the most important part. So shave six seconds off of that and use your six seconds over here. I mean, it was like surgery, surgical to make sure it had the right kind of arc and make sure that I finished on time. So I'll never forget. I like take a bow at the end and I look up and I had six seconds left on the clock. I could see the gal in the front row kind of stirring to start to get up. And it was just really intimidating. And that book is based on resonate and and I didn't know I was a researcher or writer. I mean, obviously, I think I told myself I was not that or could not be that um, based on my education. But I knew that a great speech had a rhythm or a cadence to it. Something about it kind of pulsed and it, and it kept you engaged. And then maybe you would wane a bit and then you would lean in again. It would keep you engaged. So it had this rise and fall, this cathartic rise and fall to it. And I knew it and I felt it, but nobody had ever really defined it. And so I went on a three-year journey through story. I was up at 5 a.m. until 11, and I just I just read everything, read about story structures, read about literature, cinema, um, just everything. It was so fun. And I knew the answer would be found there. And um, I remember just... I had a book called The 100 Greatest Speeches of All Time. And so I kept reading the speeches, reading the speeches. And then one day I was like, I just need to go in my office because I knew that that was the day that the shape of a great talk was going to be born. <laughs> I don't know how. And I, I just went it. in my office and I drew the shape. And and what it is, is it's this spark line where you where the greatest speeches contrasted the gap between what is what could be, what is, what could be, what is, you know, is status quo, what is, is broken, what is, has a problem, or um, what is, is the current realities. And then when you contrast the hope of an alternate future by stating, but here's what could be, here's what could be, here's what could be, people start to see, they're like, oh, my current state is not okay. And I need to move into this most, more desirable place so we could accomplish these great things in the future. And so then I went and analyzed a bunch of speeches in the book. And then I pulled out Steve Jobs' iPhone launch, quickly saw if it did. Then weirdly, it sounds so melodramatic, but I fell on my knees and cried because I thought, should I publish this? Because it could be used for good or it could be used for evil. So then the next thing I did is I took out some of Goebbels' speeches. He was the minister of media for Hitler. And I pulled out his speeches and I wept as I found, figured out every single one of his talks followed the form in almost perfect cadence, created a spark line. And then I decided, it sounds so dramatic, and it actually kind of was a very defining moment for me, but I decided there's got to be more good people in the world than evil and then I would publish this work. And so that's kind of the genesis of the whole thing. And then then I unpack it a bit about the story insights in my TED Talk. And then I analyze um, the two. I analyzed Steve Jobs and Dr. King. But I've analyzed about 100 cents. Um, and it, 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 it was so fun to do that talk. And then I tweeted about – I'd done the talk. It had been up on YouTube. And then I tweeted about – five months later that it had 50,000 views and I tagged um, TED Talks because it was a TEDx talk and they picked mm -hmm. it up the following Tuesday. It was on TED.com and they promoted it, which, wow, yeah, it's everyone's dream to get something like that, right? But it well, it wasn't on TED.com till I pointed them to it on a tweet. <laughs> yeah, nice. well, no, and it's incredible because even if you're not a public speaker or a, you know, a, cedar, a, a CEO who's giving um you know, talks to huge teams. I mean, yeah. all of the key elements there. And I think 
I, I think that what I grabbed out of it most was something that you talked about uh, just a minute ago with the what could be, yeah. because I think that that is the that's the promise. That's the hook where that's it keeps the promise. people right. Yeah. It keeps yeah. people interested and engaged and yeah. helps them start thinking about their own situation, what yeah. could be, and or how they would handle something in your story or or. Uh, anyway, I think it, it, it's so yeah. good. If, if you haven't seen it and, and definitely check it out, Nancy Duarte's, uh, Ted talk for sure. And her books, but I always ask this question of all of our guests. And, uh, I, I hope that, that you will participate here, Nancy as well, but, uh, <laughs> share a challenge or failure, uh, that you've encountered along the way. Um, you've yeah. built this incredible company. How many people probably have this totally different perspective of you? Like, you know, Nancy just was born this way. She just went and <laughs> built this giant company. She's working for, you know, everybody from uh, Salesforce to Apple to Al Gore to, you know, Cisco, HP, all of these incredible things and, you know, incredible. But Maybe there's something in there where you had a big challenge and you learned a yeah. lot about yourself or about how maybe something that you should do better going forward. Yeah. And I would love to hear it from you. I love that you asked that because I and I think a, a good leader would be honest about that uh, question. And I think it back in about 2014, um, well, it was right after my TED talk, 2011 to, so it was about 2012 to 14, the company was just growing, like just, it just made it explode, which was a result of people finding out we worked on Inconvenient Truth and people finding my TED talk. And it was like, so I went from being CEO to also public speaker. So I was kind of like that man behind the curtain, making Oz look powerful to being Oz, having to step out from the curtain and deal with what I, what I was. So what happened was, is I was on the road for 30 weeks a year, like mommy wasn't home a lot, you know, and I was on the road 30 weeks a year. It was exploding. All of that made hay, made the company grow. And that happened for three and a half, three and a half years. So I was away. I had a president that was operationally doing all the right things, but the spirit of the play, I had not wired, um, hardwired our values in tight enough and done a whole lot of work. The company actually stalled, 2015 stalled and actually started to decline culturally, financially went into a massive state of decay. And that was really, really hard. And um, it, what, what happened was I, I wasn't present. I didn't have the energy. And, and what happened when I came back and actually started to try to re-engage, I had this pull, like, be on the road, be well lit on a stage, be this big deal, was more appealing to me than coming back and cleaning up this infection. Like there was this infection in the culture and that infection right when I was coming back in was about to go septic and systemic. And I didn't have the energy. I did not have the energy. I didn't think I had the skills to turn it around. So there's a scene in um, Lord of the Rings where Frodo has been kind of stung in the heart by that spider and he's mummified in a cocoon. His face is white, his eyes are bulging and he's dead. Like he's like, they think he's actually dead. That's how I felt. I was also on deadline for my last book too. I mean, it was all like a cluster. My, I did lose a lot of weight, which is always kind of nice, but my hair was falling. I was just terrible. I didn't want to face, I think I didn't have the skills to deal with it. So it was overwhelming to know to cut out this infection. I was going to have to have some good cells come out with it. Like it was like you had to scoop it out and you always accidentally sacrifice some healthy cells in the process. So I was like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Uh, it's just too hard. I've got people who've worked for me almost 30 years, 28 years. Like it's non-trivial. And I brought in a CEO for one week, <laughs> like one week. I watched him and the way of working and the employees were experiencing cultural whiplash. So here's this infection. Now they're getting whiplash because he was such a different, I'm a heart, I, like I lead people first. We have like people over profit. We have reputation over revenue and, and it grated against our values. So, you know, it's for Tuesday, it's their second day. He leans in a meeting, puts his elbow on his knee and leans in. And he's like, if you even think I'm going to ask myself, what would Nancy do? Those days are over. And I was just like, that made me this, the antithesis of, 
of the oppositeness of what what was going to happen under someone else's care made me rise up. It made me get the resolve. I was like, if this is what it's going to take to turn around, I can do that better, you know, in my own culture. So I kind of shook off those grave clothes like Frodo had, right? And just transformed the company and myself. And everything is different today. It's breathtaking. But we did have to pull out uh, some affection. I put in a rocking, way aligned exec team. That's how we can have this hope, this moonshot. If I hadn't done all of this and none of it would have happened if I hadn't brought in a, a massively effective HR people first leader, made me brave, made me strong, was like, this is the right thing, you know, kept backing me up and kept in a really winsome way. We let a lot of people go. And so I remember reading in Howard Schultz's book Onward that the most difficult part for a CEO of him is when these people who were the right people to get them here aren't the right people to get them there. And he said he would weep, you know, and it was hard for him. And and that was that moment of separating, separating and renewal um, that was that I didn't think I could do. And I have to say, I do think the last few years have been my finest hour. Oh, I didn't do anything right by any means, but to go from this almost near, I was like at near death as a leader to um, rising, getting the resolve to make all the changes that needed to happen. And I'm, I'm really proud of my team, really, really proud of my team for that. And, um, I failed. Like you can't step away in, in, in the short term too. We've renewed our values, made them very, very clear, have a really strong vision, all those things. It's, they're non-trivial. So here we are company. This is what we do for other people. And it wasn't clear uh, within my own, um, you know, the boundaries of my own property, you know, in my own firm. And it, it was a real moment for me. Well, that's incredible that you faced it. And that you really yeah. showed up for it too. So that's yeah. a, that's a great story and lots of learnings in there too. Yeah. So, so incredible to speak with you and thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and insights. So I mean, no, just so, so good. And you truly are an inspiration to me and so many others and just the way that you've been able to not only help uh, us understand more about how to build a business as you've done, but also so many other people that you've helped and companies that you've helped and consumers that you've helped really understand um, how they can benefit uh, as well from so many companies that have, have you've worked with over the years too. It's really, really awesome. So where can my uh, listeners find out more about Duarte? You talked about a lot of your services that you guys are doing. It's not just for uh, senior executives. You actually got programs. So where's the best place for people to learn about those? Oh, it's awesome. So Duarte.com. And then there's a, a special place I made for people on podcasts, which is Duarte.com slash Nancy. And then I'm pretty active on LinkedIn like you are. It's a great place to to have business content. And so I'm up there and uh, Twitter at Nancy Duarte and also at Duarte is the company to follow up there. So great. Well, everybody yeah. definitely follow Nancy and thanks everybody for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us. And we have amazing, amazing guests who are telling all kinds of stories and lessons of uh, hard stuff and things that maybe you think you're going through on your own. Uh, but if you tune in, you will hear that you are not alone. So uh, definitely give this episode five stars and uh, really helps the algorithm when you do that, by the way. And I can be found on all platforms at Kara Golden. If you haven't already, I picked up a copy of my book, Undaunted. Uh, please do that. It's also on Audible. And as Nancy mentioned, she has incredible books that uh, you should definitely have a look um, at uh, Amazon or anywhere else to get her books um, on Duarte's site, I'm sure as well. And we're here every Monday, Wednesday, and now Friday as well. We just added another day. Um, so thank you everyone for listening. Have a great rest of the week.